he will also interest in the eclipse. The main benefit that I see in the eclipse is to bring something interesting in science and people. And our country can really use a lot more scientists and a lot more mathematicians. So I'm very happy to see, see the eclipse going along and encourage, encourage the uh, interest in science. Now, uh, I'm not going to mention the glasses to you. Uh, a couple of things you need to know with the glasses. Number one, we only give them to adults. Because they look like the old 3D glasses, but they're truly science education, and if you treat them wrong, you can hurt your eyes, okay? Uh, if they have any pinholes in them or any cracks in them, rip them up one way to use them. They have a special coating on both sides. They uh, eliminate the ultraviolet and the infrared red. The infra infrared side uh, from the spectrum. But you can look safely at the sun with them. You don't even have to wait for the Well, if there's a sun today, you can look at the sun today. But you'll find them very interesting during the eclipse. So, uh, having said that, I brought a number with me. If the crowd stays this size, we won't bother with the raffle because I'll have enough for, for all the adults in the world. So, anyway, my name is Dean I've been working with NASA out there for a number of years, what they call a solar system ambassador. My, this is what my mission is to bring the world of science, the world of NASA, and the mission of NASA to the public to try to generate interest in it. And it, uh, it's a field I've been interested in since I was about five years old, so uh, I really like it. Today we're going to talk about the solar eclipse of the sun. It's going to happen on August 21st, that's Monday. It will start on the East Coast about 1.30 in the afternoon and end about 4 o'clock. So it's about two and a half hour progression. However, the time you really want to see it is quarter of three, 2.45. That's when it will be peaking down south, but up here, that's what would be at our maximum. You will see about 62% of it. And at quarter three, that is when you'll see that amount. And that part, that period lasts about two and a half minutes. But of course, it builds up all the way there. And it's not going to be up. So at quarter three, you definitely want to be out, outside looking at, at the eye. Uh, but who, who has seen an eclipse before here? Anybody seen an eclipse? Yeah, that's great. Now, who's seen a total eclipse? Much less people, right? I have a number, a number of people in my astronomy group who, uh, who right now are out in the west, the great side of over, where the weather has a 92% chance, chance of being absolutely clear that day. And they're going out there to see it because it's such an astounding event, <coughs> very emotional. If they want to be there to see it again, and we have members who've seen, travel all over the world, seen 10 or 15 or 20 of them, because they won't miss the total solar eclipse. There. It's so meaningful and so moving. So it's a very good thing to see. The hotels out there have been booked for a year. And uh, the good Americans treat each other fairly. The rooms, the rooms out there are costing like three thousand dollars a night. Wow. So how is the solar eclipse happening? Well, I'm going to show you. Uh, so I see you two boys. Can you hear me? I want I want you to be near it. Okay. Let you be moved. I like you to be the sun. Okay? So what do you see what you see? Now, if you if you were stand right there, and if you would stand right down there, the hole is up high so you can see you see the way through. Now you're gonna catch on the sun at all times, okay? And the moon orbits around the sun, right? So walk around the sun. So, and when the moon gets here, right between the sun and the earth, the shadow of the moon falls on the earth. And it cuts a swath 70 miles wide. That's the totality area. And uh, that's how it happens. Now, it, it, it's, it's really an astounding thing because that shadow, I had a picture of the shadow from space I don't have to do Okay, just thank you very much. Keep going back. That's basically how a solar eclipse happens. The sun shines nice and bright. And the moon picks up its shadow and comes down in a cone shape. And right now, it's going to last us for quite a while. But since the moon orbits the sun once a month, it orbits, a, it orbits the um, uh, it orbits once a month. It orbits at 2,288 miles an hour. Why do we not have an eclipse every month? Well, the reason is the Earth has a five to six percent tilt, not like the orbit of the moon. It doesn't go on a level plane around the Earth like this goes like this. 
So it isn't always between the sun and the earth. So the moon's 400 times smaller than the sun. How could it cover the entire the entire sun? The sun is 400 times as large. Because the sun's further away. Absolutely, the sun's further away. The sun is 400 times further away. So it's a relative distance. <coughs> and, and by the way, on I, I, I this question, uh, I don't mind questions at all. If you have a question while we're talking, just, just call my attention to yourself. So this moon's 400 times smaller than the sun, it's 400 times closer to the Earth, and that enables the eclipse to happen. The size, its location, its distance, it's just right for an eclipse. Now this something I, how many people knew this? The sun is moving away from the Earth, you know, good for you, it's moving away from the Earth at one and a half inches a year. That means over the course of your lifetime, you'll move about 96 inches away from you. So it's moving further and further away. Now, it'll never move so far away that it leaves its orbit. Because the orbits are a function of mass and speed. So once it gets far enough away, its speed will equal what it needs to stay in orbit around the Earth forever. Well, what does this mean? It does have an effect on that. The moon's 238,900 miles from Earth right now. In 500 million to 650 million years, going away at that inch and a half a year, it'll be so far away that it'll no longer be close enough to block the full effect of the sun. So after that, there will never be another eclipse. So enjoy it now, because in half a million years, in half a million years, it'll go away. So this is what an eclipse looks like from beginning to end. It starts here, with just a little, little touch of the sun going, it moves up. This is what we call the diamond ring, because there's, one, there's a valley on the moon, the sun comes through it. And it just leaves that one bright spot. And so it looks like a diamond ring. Now, as far as viewing the eclipse with your naked eye, you can't do it. Okay? Even when you see this little, little bit of a lot of people think that you can look at it because it's only that little bit. But you've all seen the full moon, right? And then it's so bright you can read by the full moon. This little bit is a billion times brighter than the moon, full moon. So you can't even look at it there without eye protection. Every year after the total eclipse, some hospital somewhere has patients come in with eye damage. So it's very important that you look at it right. Then we have totality. This is what lasts about two minutes and 40 seconds. This is the sun's corona. And this is a very important time for scientists. And we learn a lot from it. You all heard Einstein's theory of relativity. It was never proven. It was accepted, but not proven until it totally eclipsed came by, and they could prove it. And that's because part of his theory was that uh, gravity can bend light. Well, what the scientists did at the time, they looked at where the stars were behind in the location of the sky. And you can't study the sun when it's full bright. It's just too bright. And what they did during the eclipse, they looked for those stars again. And the stars are actually over here. But in the eclipse, they look like they're over here because the light was bent. So they proved Einstein's theory of relativity. Then after the leaves there, it goes once again to the dying ring, a little less, a little less, and it goes away. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice experience. It happened about 18 months, every 18 months. They travel in pairs, you do, because the orbit doesn't change that fast. So what's the single most important thing to know about watching the eclipse? Eye protection. protection. Never look directly at it except during totality. When we have totality, that middle phase, you can take the sunglasses, the uh, protection glasses off, and you can look at it. See, you see the stars in the sky, you see the planet Mercury, and uh, you see Mars or, or Saturn or something with it. You see the stars, a couple of the planets. You do that, and I, I just slipped and said, take off the sunglasses. Just Take that off, you say, sunglasses don't make it. Sunglasses will not protect you at all. You can put 10 of them in a row, they still won't protect you. All sunglasses do is dim the light. They won't filter out the harmful rays. So never, never use, use sunglasses for This is totality, and this is what we'll see in Southridge, 60 to 70 percent. So it will never be less safe to look at the sun directly during the eclipse in Southridge. Charleston Webster mm -hmm. So permanent air blindness can result from it. 
and there isn't a doctor on the face of the earth who can bring your vision back because it does that kind of damage to it. So we're not going to stare at the sun kids, right? Not going to stare at it at all. We went to the Oregon, into the United States of Oregon, Salem, Oregon, a little town up here, about 1018 Pacific Daylight Time. Now that's a three hour difference from us. And it leaves the United States at 2.48 Eastern Standard Time at Charleston, South Carolina. Anyone have any idea how fast that shadow of the, of the moon travels across the surface of the Earth? Average speed of 1,807 miles an hour. So the Earth is, the, the United States is about 3,000 miles wide and they'll cover it in an hour and a half. And see, it goes right straight through the center of the country. This is where a lot of the guys are going, right up in here. So you have four tips to remember during this solar eclipse. Don't look directly at the sun. Sunglasses won't provide protection. Use an approved solar filter or a number 14 wellness glass. A number 13 is a very minimum. If, uh, the number 14 is the maximum. If you go to 15, you won't see any, it's too dark. If you go to 12, it's going to let too much of the rays Oh, well, it can create a pinhole projector with a cardboard box. It's safe and easy way. This is a pinhole projector. Uh, it's simply a box. You take a wet piece of paper to the inside and the bottom. Make a little hole up here. The sun shines through like that. It reflects here. It'll actually show the eclipse on you. Uh, <coughs> you don't have to put your head in the box. But you can use any box that works. Your cereal box is the most common. But if you've got a new refrigerator, you can use your refrigerator box if you want. But you have to climb inside of it to see it. With direct viewing glasses, look for the sun-safe legend. And you can't put these glasses on your binoculars, your telescope, or a camera. And it's, 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 we now use cameras with the LED screens. So if you look at that safety. But the ray of the light coming in through the magnification camera can use to burn out the internal, internal parts of the camera. So, we're not really going to make one today. This, I, I also use this presentation in the school system. And I have the kids, they make it sort of good. But I'm going to show you how. So when you get home, if you want to make a pinhole with viewer, you can do it. Because it's kind of fun, something good you can do with your kids, your grandkids. But you need basically a box of cereal, a piece of silver foil, scotch tape, a scissors, a pencil, and a little piece of silver foil. So you cut a sheet of paper, white paper, just smaller than the bottom of the box, so like this. And this is what we made with minute rice. Put some glue on the back of that, and then you stick it down on the inside and glue it to the bottom of the box. Cut the top off the box, the tabs. We'll cut the whole box, about an inch and a half from each end and take the middle flat closed. <coughs> then you put the silver foil over one end of the box. And that's sort of like your veins. And with a pencil or a pin punch, a small hole into the foil. You see, it's about side. Now, don't take the pencil and go like, boom, because it'll shatter the silver foil. Just put the tip against it and grab it, push it a little harder, and it'll punch through. Now, when I made these, the piece was smaller, I have a single hole punch at home. I just use a zip hole punch, punch it in the foil before I tack them on. And this is how you usually do it. Now, not quite like she's but she's looking she's out. But basically, you put the sun behind you, so let's say the screen is the, screen is the sun. You look in this hole, and the sun is going to come in this hole. So you hold it like this. But before you do that, you look at the shadow on the ground. You make the shadow as small as you possibly can. This is how you line it up. And the shadow will probably be just like this. But you want the smallest shadow you can possibly get. And then you start to go like this, and you, and you make, you make you may still have to wiggle a bit to get it, but you'll see the sun on that white screen in there. So it's a real simple projector. And uh, it'll let you safely view the whole eclipse. Decorate it. Go on Google and fit bubble images or space images. And decorate your box a little bit. Now, this is the one which is the, one that has the least expensive fastest and most economical way to make a, make a pinhole viewer. Get two paper plates or two foam plates. Put a hole in one. The hole in one near you, 
once again, you're back to the sun, like this, you just put the sun on the second plate. Boy, and that's all you have to do. Can you do a pinhole project? Can you do it with any two pieces of paper? Yeah. But that's, the, the, the paper plates are sort of stiff, so you can fold them well. But that's the easiest, least expensive, and fastest way. We have two plates, a bunch of holes in it, you all done. Well, Eclipse has a lot of myths and beliefs. Uh, <coughs> years ago, uh, young kids won't remember this, but some of the adults will. Who remembers Howie Dooney? Come on, yeah. raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going right here. <laughs> Howie Dooney was a puppet show with uh, Buffalo Law. It's on TV, one of the most popular TV shows ever for kids. At very, very, no one went anywhere without seeing Howie Dooney. Well, there was this young man who used to watch Howdy Doody every day. His mother used to sit on the TV bar. And the Howdy Doody show producers heard about the Tony Tony Eclipse. They said, okay, we're going to put that on the show. And then we all talked about high damage watching the Eclipse. The day of Eclipse, his mother would not let him watch Howdy Doody because of the Eclipse, because she was afraid he'd damage his eyes looking at the TV. Well, you're not going to damage your eyes looking at the TV. Other than to damage your brain, you can watch your eyes. The ancient Chinese believe that solar eclipses occurred when a legendary celestial dragon eats the sun. So that was one, one thing they believed at that time. The Yin Shia shows an ancient Chinese myth as well. Tiangu was a black dog who ate the sun. You see the archer here is trying to get rid of the dog. In Hindu mythology, Rahu is known for swallowing the sun and causing eclipses. You see, he's over here, he's, he's eating the sun. Norse cultures blame most to eat the sun. It's even really ferocious looking book for it. Korean folklore suggests that so many pictures happen as mythical dogs are trying to steal the sun. And these three look like the Queen Gio. Yorkies or Yorkies? Corgis. Yorkies. Yorkies. Yeah. Traditionally, people in many cultures get together and bang pots and pans because that thought they scared away the demon that was blocking the sun. Now this is interesting, because this is not a myth. This, this, we have the diary, the, the, the traveler's diary of the this event. And the overcast day in the seven, actually 1700s, I missed it on the chart. A solar eclipse occurred while the wagon train was headed out west. The pioneers panicked, because the day started to get dark. And they didn't know what was going on. It was overcast, and they couldn't see the sun. Now in the 1700s, they knew what a solar eclipse was. But they couldn't see the sun because the door was closed. All they knew was the world was getting packed. They thought the world was coming to an end. So the wagon asked us, said, everybody out of the train, trains, get down your knees, we're going to pray. We're going to pray to save, to save ourselves. We get down and prayed and miraculously, it was saved. The sun the light came back in just a few minutes. And of course, there's fake news too. Judgment day, the end is near, not going to happen. Once the eclipse go by, nothing in your life is going to change. You still have to go to work the next day. You still have to mow the lawn or shovel the snow. You still have to go to the grocery store. And you still have to keep the kids happy. So how do you enjoy the eclipse? Well, watch nature in action is one of the best ones. Now these things all happen during the eclipse, but they're going to be very limited in our area because we don't have a total eclipse. But birds may go to roost. And at one of these sessions, someone said, what's roosting? That means nest. You know, they may go to the nest. Uh, <coughs> animals would go to bed. The, eat, the night animals, the crickets, and they may start chirping. And it may get a few degrees cold. Now, up here, you'll notice very little, if any, of that. You get the total eclipse. But if you're in Briggs, Idaho, you have a chance to see it. The temperature, I have a friend who saw the last total eclipse. <coughs> And it's not like it's a gradual back, it's a little bit great. But when he first finally drops out that last little bit of the diamond ring, it could dark kind of fast. And he said, he was so emotional, he said, I felt like I was dying. So the world died around me. Those were very, very emotional. People who've been there will tell you, they get very excited when they talk about it. It's such a moving, moving experience. Watch the TV news programs going right now. And watch what they say is going to happen. Watch their predictions. And then just after, just compare them with the actual events. 
So you can see, see how the actual thing works. And you go to Eclipse 2017 go out and ask to learn more about the upcoming Eclipse. The major channels on TV are going to be showing the Eclipse. You, I think starting around 1 o'clock. You can go to nasatv.gov and they'll be broadcasting the clips. Now NASA's been preparing for this for three years now because it's a very important science to be done. We can learn so much about the sun's corona, that's that area to here, because we can't see that normally. We can't see it, the sun can watch it up. But now we'll be able to see it, so we'll study it. But we have telescopes from space aimed at it, telescopes on ground aimed at it. There's satellites over the Earth that are aimed at it. We have all kinds of equipment on the Earth looking at it. We have thousands of amateur astronomers who are going to be watching this, this occur. We have two jet planes who are going to fly ahead of the eclipse as a question that is, that is it, taking pictures of the eclipse as it happens. Because we can learn so much from this. So much from this. Now the next solar system will happen in North America April 8, 2024. It's going to enter down here through Texas, through Mexico, come in through Texas and go up through Vermont. So up here is where we are, so as you can see, we're going to have much better time seven years from now. We're going to have this time. So stick around for that. That'll be worth seeing. Yes? So like the glasses, they don't like expire, right? You just tuck them away safely for seven years from now, you'd still be able to use them? Well, no. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't, because the coating may not last. Gotcha. You know, like, it, like any chemical they have a lifespan. So uh, after two or three years, you really don't want to but don't worry, there'll be plenty of glasses out going out again then. Right now, uh, at NASA, we're giving out 60,000 sets of glasses. It's a, well, will we be in the totality in 2024? You'll be pretty close to it. You'll be very, very close. I mean, this Massachusetts over here, you see the totality is right there. So you're probably in the 90%. Degree. Over the 200 mile drive, you could be there. Yeah. Just remember, at least a year ahead of time, reserve your book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before they raise the rates. <laughs> Any other question about the eclipse itself? Which, which place in South Beach is the best to do the eclipse? Is it out in the open or in the air? Oh, yeah, I'd go to Dress Hill. Although I'm sure they're doing hundreds of people in Dress Hill. I know when there's a good, a good night for the Persian showers, if you go to Dress Hill, you have to look for a parking place. So a lot of people are interested, but that's a good place to go. The airport would be a good place to go. Oh, big heaven, yeah. The higher the hill, the, what you want is a big sky. Well, we do a little solar system challenge so everybody knows about, about the whole we live in. Okay. So these are true or false. Just yell out the answer, okay? You know, Airs is one of our minor planets, so like this. Same classification now as Pluto, walking in. It's closest planet to the sun. Is that true or false? Is it false? Anybody else? False. It's false. Mercury is the planet closest to the sun. Eris is a rock planet. Earth is the only planet with human life. No kind of, no of any kind has been found anywhere in space. Venus has been called Earth's sister planet. Is that true or false? True. Both planets are about the same size. So they can have similar elements. So they call them sister planets. Mars has hundreds of moons. Mars has only two moons, Phobos and Phobos. They call them dogs of war because Mars the planet named after the daughter of war. So they call it the, 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 the daughter of war. Now, Phobos is a bit of a problem for us here. Okay, because Phobos is what we call a rock pile planet. It means it's a bunch of rocks all together. They're not really glued together. They're not that strong. And it, it, over the next couple million years, it's going to disintegrate, and the, the rocks are going to fall into Mars. So it's not a problem for us, it's a problem for Mars. So, a few million years ago, Mars had only one moon. Jupiter has a great dark spot. It's a great red spot. Well, Jupiter has a great red spot. Who said great red spot? Very good. We're not like 
Saturn is known for its rings. It is true. Now, if you have a telescope and you look at the planets at night, this is the most beautiful thing. All of the planets have rings of some sort or other. But this one is the ones you can see on the regular telescope. Some of the others we didn't, like Uranus, we didn't even know it had rings to send a spacecraft out there to, out there to see it. Last, uh, a couple of years ago, we sent the Moon spacecraft out to visit Pluto. That's why we have nice, clear pictures of Pluto. Until then, all we have is foggy ones. But once we got to Pluto, that meant the United States had explored every single planet in the solar system. So that's fantastic. Saturn has the most pronounced rings in the solar system. So that one was true. Neptune has a great red spot, true or false? Oh, Neptune has a great dark spot. Mercury, Saturn, and Uranus can be seen with an unaided eye. True or false? Uh, Uranus can only be seen with an optical eye. So you can't see Uranus with, uh, with just a uh, no, the telescope. Can you see it with the telescope that we have with the library? You know, I never tried that. I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see that you could. That's a nice telescope the library has. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Holly. As long as you don't know, uh, my astronomy group, <coughs> we buy telescopes and modify them so the public who's in experience with scopes can use them easily without ruining the settings or anything like that. And we find sponsors who donate it to libraries. And the Selfish Library has one. It's donated by Selfish Rotary Club, who also donated one to the Childhood Library. And we've given out 117 scopes to libraries in Massachusetts. And just in the cost, we've given out 17 more. But you rent them just like a book. You come in, you rent it, you take it home, you get it for two weeks, you return it. But you have one, one week. 18? One week. Oh, so one week rented? Yeah. Okay. So you rent it for one week. Uh, is it, you have the 18, I believe, right, Margaret? You have the 18 to rent it? Yes, yes. And I'm saying rent is a wall. It also takes a lot of schlepping to get it out here. It's in a big uh, container, mm -hmm. so you might need help. Yeah. But it's, it's portable, and uh, it's well, a wonderful thing to have. And we also, if I might, just okay. jump in for a minute. Please. Um, in addition to the telescope, the library also subscribes to two periodicals. Um, so two magazines that you can take out and borrow, and um, one of them is uh, Sky and Telescope, and the other one is Astronomy. So, you know, we do support um, the topic, so, you know, the more people would use it, the more we'd be inclined to buy. So it would be great if people were interested enough to come in and uh, borrow some of the materials that we have. And if you borrow the telescope, it's a good idea to borrow one of those books at the same time, because mm -hmm. they all have a center panel in the book that tells you what's in the sky at that time. So we up to the Also, the thing comes in a tote like this, so it weighs 22 pounds. So it's not like a big it's scope that weighs 80 pounds, 90 pounds. It's a 22 pounder. It's what we call a table telescope. You put it on the hood of your car or on a table or something like that. It's a very, it's a, it's called, a, it's an Orion Astro Glass, four and a half inch one. And we think it's one of the very best uh, status scopes out there. So, who was the night? Planet in our solar system? Well, it's not classified as a dwarf planet. Now understand, that doesn't mean it's not a planet. It's still a planet. It's just a different category. There are more than two, two dwarf planets in the solar system. True, true or false? True. There are others that it's hoped that the New Horizons spacecraft, the one with the Pluto, will find more. That spacecraft is still traveling around. And it's going, headed on to another destination to find another one. So right now we have Pluto, Eris, Ceres, Maki, Maki, and Humea. And there's a bunch of others that we just don't have any more. Now just, just you know, I've mentioned the horizon is still traveling. When NASA sends anything into space, you can't send it up with just a single system. Because you can't fix it. It's gone, it's millions of miles away. <coughs> there's programming changes you can make, because that's all done during the telescope. You can't fix it, so we have to put redundant systems in, we have to consider the cold, the heat, the radiation, the path, everything. So that it, it, um, it had to be really well built. 25 years ago, 25 to 30 years, we built two spacecraft, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And we did a tour of the, the solar system for us. 
the point of fact, they have both left the solar system. They're 12 billion miles away. They're the first interstellar space spacecraft ever. Interstellar meaning they've left the solar system. They've gone beyond that hero stream and out there. They get another 20 years to work. The, the mission's over, but they can work another 20 years. They still send us messages back, although it takes a day or so for the message to get to us. And it's a very weak signal. We have these huge telescopes and radio telescopes to pick them up. But that's how well these things are built. Uh, some of the things, the rovers on Mars, we built a two year mission, which can go in 10 years later. So they're, they're really well built. I mean, the money we invest in this is really well invested. Mm -hmm. Yes? What is the protocol for naming planets? Like, like Supposedly, the international organization names it. But if you discover one, you should get the privilege. Mm -hmm. even, even in our spacecraft, it, it, it's funny how, how in our spacecraft works. To name them, quite often, we have a contest, the school kids. And I said, you guys. And <coughs> of the, uh, there are two, two rovers on Mars. You know, there, there are three, three kinds of things we set up. One is an orbiter. That goes to like Mars and orbits. Another is a rover that lands on Mars and then moves around. And the third is just a lander, which goes to stays where it is in the future. But there are two of them called Spirit and Opportunity. <coughs> and how we got the name of that? We held a contest. We had 10,000 kids send in suggestions. And uh, it was a kids only contest. We've done this in a number of This young girl named Sophie Kolas. She was Russian, and she was an orphan. She was in an orphanage in Russia. And this woman from the United States, I think Beverly Coates, adopted her brought her to America. And her entry talked about that. Her entry said, as a child in Russia, I was in an orphanage. At night, I would look up to the, the night sky who dreamed that maybe I could, I could do something. Maybe I, maybe I could get out of here. Maybe I could be a good person and have a good life. She said, and then, the closest came and got me to talk and brought me to America. And my life has been good ever since. She said, she said, and I just wanted to thank all of America for the spirit and the opportunity. And so we named the ship Spirit and Opportunity. And uh, there's a couple of others who named, named Spacecraft for us. Well, that, that's the basis of the uh, presentation. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to, to help you. But what I do want to do is I want to pass around to the kids. Uh, just take a look at that. I need these for this afternoon's presentation. But pass these around. Take a look. This is what a pinball viewer looks like. Okay, good. The good news is I have enough glasses for all adults. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be very glad to see you. Yes, sir. You mentioned that the eclipse occurs every one and a half year. Yes, yes about eight, eight months. But I can't find the knowledge as to why it chooses a particular spot on the Earth. And why, how do you find out the uh, distance from one to the other? And why does it end with so many hours? Well, <coughs> because, well, first of all, you go into night. But it, the, the way it picks a place depends on its orbit. Yes. Its orbit. And its orbit, let's say, is at that five degree tilt. But at the same time, Earth and the Moon are orbiting around the Sun. The Sun is orbiting around the galaxy, and the galaxy is orbiting. So it, it changes. But it comes back to the same place every time. In fact, there's a routine. It's called, I think, it's every, every 18 years, the eclipse duplicates itself. Right. So, is it because of the curvature of the Earth? Is it because of the axis? And you just mentioned that every year the sun is changing by one and a half inch. Yes, the moon. So how does that fit in to every 18 year? It, 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 oh, 18 years, one and a half inches a year. A year. It, it's not that many, it's like 10 feet, so it's not a big difference on the 18 month period. But over the of millions of years, it's a huge difference. Yeah. To me, if something has to change, 
the axis has to change mm -hmm. or the rotation has to change to the correct spot and then the direction of the uh, eclipse. Mm -hmm. and partial and total. And why does it last two minutes? Well, that's that's just totality. The whole eclipse lasts two and a half hours. Yeah, no, no. Totality. Why two and a half minutes? Oh, I because the Earth, the Moon is moving at 2,088 miles an hour. Yeah, so it's moving in and out. If the sun is here and I'm here, it comes like this is moving through us. So it's at that, that, that speed, it doesn't take a long. At the same time, the Earth is rotating at 900 miles an hour. So you think it is because of the rotation of the Earth at the speed of the moon that the spots have changed? It, it, it might have, but I, I think the orbits could, well, they're not exactly the same. See, we don't have really circular, we often have the orbit as a circle. No, I don't it really isn't, it's just slightly oval. So it affects you. You don't think in all these millions of years, the axis of this Earth and the Sun have changed? The axis changes every 23,500 years. We call it precession, because the Earth is not, if you go like a magnetic pole, it's not up like that. The Earth is like this. And that's what gives us our seasons. But every 26,000 years, as it rotates, the axis goes 180 degrees over, then another 180 degrees over. And this is the opposite discussion. Do you think the climate change is because partially also due to the change of axis and rotation? No, climate change, I think, has two reasons. Number one, it's a, it's a normal phenomenon on Earth. It happens have, have like every 60,000, every 100 years. And uh, number two, uh, the effect of billions of people, billions of animals, let methane out into the air to natural human functions. And the uh, pollution we throw in the air, like, that has to affect it as well. But that's what I'm trying to put you as I did. Yeah. Well, uh, talking about it. Yes. Okay. But that, that's what that Any other questions you have? Yes, ma'am. How safe is it to be outside when this is all happening if you don't have glasses? No problem at all. Just as long as you're not staring at the sun. Or even looking, they say like even one second. Like a quick glance, like is that going to blind you, or is that more like? No, you kind of want to go. I'm just going to look real quick. I I, I would. <laughs> I would. So would it be safest just to stay inside then for like little kids that don't have glasses? Well, if they're not looking at the sun, they'll be fine. I think they just don't want them looking at the sun. There's no danger. There's no danger from the eclipse for anyone in the world. No danger at all. The only danger would be self-imposed <coughs> if you went up and you look, look at this steer down like that. Um, anything else I can answer? Anything else? How safe are those glasses that they're selling, like at Walmart? Or, I mean, are they? I, I don't really know, but you want the ISO designation on it. Okay. Uh, the glasses you have today are right from NASA, so these are, these are perfectly safe. But uh, the thing is, I say. You don't need a glass for everybody in the game. It's a lot of Margaret. Okay. So um, let's um, finish up the program. And I'd like to thank you know, very much for coming in, especially in such short notice. And I think this is the part that everybody's excited about, is having some glasses so that you can actually view the solar eclipse. And now that you know all about it, you will have a very good chance. So um, if these are only going to be given out to the adults, so if, if people as they're leaving would come by and do the testimony.